we'll be starting in just a few minutes. So if you could please find your seat, we'll be starting in just a few minutes. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. If you can start to find your seats, please, we'll be starting in just a few minutes.
Good morning. For those of you who watched the San Antonio Spurs and need your pacemakers reset from last night, once again, it's not over until it's over. Tremendous, tremendous thing. Well, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you today. Uh, I'm Dr. Paul Parks, the Executive Director of the Ecumenical Center for Religion and Health. And it's my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce to you Dr. James Gordon and also the organizations that made this possibility, this possibility possible. The opportunity to hear Dr. Gordon is brought to you as a collaborative programming effort of Methodist Healthcare Ministries, the Center for Medical Humanities and Ethics, and the Ecumenical Center. Today's program is part of our ongoing series of conversations about ethics. I would also like you to remember that Dr. Gordon will be speaking this evening from 6 to 8 at the UT Health Science Center Auditorium on self-care and mutual help, the future of health care, and the moral imperative. Dr. Gordon is a Harvard-educated psychiatrist, a world-renowned expert in using mind-body medicine to heal depression, anxiety, and psychological trauma. He's the founder and director of the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, dean of the Graduate School of Mind-Body Medicine at Saybrook University, a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Family Medicine at Georgetown Medical School. Dr. Gordon has created groundbreaking programs of comprehensive mind-body healing for physicians, medical students, and other health professionals for individuals with cancer, depression, and other chronic illnesses, and for traumatized children and families in Bosnia, Kosovo, Israel, Gaza, post-9-11 New York, and post-Katrina Southern Louisiana, as well as for the U.S. military's returning service men and women from Iraq and Afghanistan. In areas where psychological trauma is widespread, he and his organization have created local leadership teams to fully integrate the CMBM model into the ongoing services for the entire community or nation. His most recent book, Unstuck, Your Guide to the Seven Stages, Seven Stage Journey Out of Depression. Please join me in welcoming this day, Dr. Jim Gordon. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it's great to be here, to be back here uh, in San Antonio. And some of you have come up and whom I met on previous visits. So um, I'm uh, wanting to give you, during the course of this day together, and it's great to see so many of you, during this course of this day together, I want to give you both some information, but perhaps more importantly, to give you an experience of the work that we do at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine and give you a sense of how you might integrate what we have to offer into what you're doing now or into what you would like to do here in San Antonio in your community. There'll be uh, time uh, for us to talk together and I'm hoping that you will, uh, as questions come up, that you'll ask them. You don't have to wait till the end. Uh, if I wait till the end, I'd forget what I wanted to ask. So please feel free uh, to raise your hand and we'll talk. And if you have a question, do we have a mic for people who are asking questions? That'd be great. We'll have a mic for people who are asking questions. Um, the way we begin the work that we do, that Paul described, and, and incidentally, the latest program, which I'll talk a little bit about later in the day that we're doing is in Haiti, where we're hoping to create a, the first ever national program of mental health care, of self-care and mutual help in Haiti. So I'll talk a little bit about that later on, because I think it has, there are lessons there for all of us. Uh, the way we begin is by making sure that we're actually in the place that we are. I don't mean I can look outside, oh, am I in the right 
you know, am I in the right, the way they do on the airplane? Are you sure you want to go to uh, Reykjavik or whatever the airplane is? This is the flight to Reykjavik. Not so much in that sense, but simply in the sense of relaxing and coming into the place where we are at this moment. This is really crucial. One of the deep problems, I was thinking about an article that I'm writing for stressed out uh, doctors. And one, one of the deep problems that they have is they're not really where they want to be. So they're always thinking about how it used to be better or how it could be better, which means they're not in the place where they need to be, which is right here in this moment with this person and with themselves. So the funda fundamental part of creating a mind-body approach, a fundamental part of creating a humane and effective way of helping other people is through the work and the joy of meditation. And by meditation, I don't mean something fancy or esoteric or anything connected with a particular religious practice. The word for meditation in both Sanskrit and Greek, there is the same root as medicine. They don't teach that in medical school, but it's medi, and it means to both take the measure of and to care for. So medicine is about analyzing situation, diagnosing, and it's about caring for people, treating. Meditation is about becoming aware of what's happening in the moment and caring for ourselves by relaxing into that moment. And the divide between meditation and medicine in the West came hundreds of years ago, many hundreds of years ago, probably when medicine separated from the church in the late Middle Ages. But it's time to bring them back together, to bring medicine and meditation back, to see them as a whole. Because if we don't, we're going to continue down a kind of reflexive path where we're always reacting and we're always overwhelmed and we're always stressed out. So whenever I begin working in a training program, when I begin a workshop, when I begin working with a group of people, and often enough with individual patients in my office, we begin with a little meditation. So I'm gonna teach you totally non-denominational meditation. You don't have to change your clothes. You don't have to go to the Himalayas. You don't have to put on any amulets. It has the esoteric name of soft belly. So sit comfortably in your chairs. And best if you have your feet on the ground. Um, there's a, uh, you know, sometimes it's nice to cross your legs. I cross my legs. But interestingly, it's a posture that is not used in the non-Western world very much. Uh, it's not the most relaxed posture when push comes to shove. And especially if you have a bad back, lower back, it tends to throw out the uh, kinetics and dynamics of the lower back a bit. So sit comfortably with your feet on the floor and allow your breathing to deepen. If you feel comfortable, close your eyes. Let yourself breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. This may be a little unfamiliar to some of you. It's a very relaxing way to breathe. Let your breathing deepen and allow your belly to be soft. If the belly is soft, 
more air goes to the bottom of the lungs, and there's better oxygen exchange. And oxygen is the necessary fuel for all the cells in our body, and particularly for the brain cells. If the belly is soft, it activates the vagus nerve, which runs up from the abdomen through the chest back to the central nervous system in the brain. The vagus nerve is the antidote to the fight or flight and stress response. When it's activated, it produces relaxation. If the belly is soft, then all the other muscles in the body tend to relax as well. To encourage this process, you can say to yourself, soft, as you breathe in, and belly, as you breathe out. If thoughts come, let them come and let them go. Gently bring your mind back to soft belly. Open your eyes, gently bring your attention back into the room. So, how many of you notice any change from before you did soft ballet till after, these three or four minutes? Just want to see hands. Excellent. What kind of change? Please. I feel more alert and relaxed. More relaxed? And alert. More relaxed, relax, relaxed and relert. Right, I got it. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. You're here. Fantastic. I feel at peace Beautiful. Okay. Anyone have trouble with this? Troubles are good. We learn from our troubles. Yes. Okay, what she's saying, in case you didn't hear, she said she felt some anxiety. 
How many either felt anxiety or some kind of thought about something you had to attend to or that was going to be of concern? Yeah, this is perfectly natural. <laughs> That's fine. The notion that meditation means no thoughts is an absurd notion. <clears throat> that may happen for a few seconds. In India, they call it a samadhi. No mind, totally connected with everything. Beautiful if it happens. But for most of us, the things that are there, that are in our lives, that may be preoccupying, troubling us, will come up. That's fine. You're not, you're not trying to eradicate anxiety. You're trying to relax with anxiety. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Sometimes, most of you, how many of you are clinicians of one kind or another? Clinicians are, so most, most of you, many of you. Idea here is people come and they say, I want to make it all go away. Well, you can't make it go away. But that's why they give so many drugs. You want to make it go away. Well, if you give enough drugs, obviously the whole mind starts going away. And often the emotions go away first. But the idea is not to make it go away. The idea is to begin to notice what's there in the world of psychotherapy. Psychotherapy at its base is about becoming aware of what's going on. Relaxing helps you to become aware of what's actually going on. And then as you relax with what may be troubling you, it starts to change. It no longer has its unconscious hold on you. Something came up for me as we were doing this. I had a phone call. It's about something, you know, something stressful that I have to deal with, uh, you know, a week or 10 days or something like that. It came into my mind while I was doing this breathing. Oh, okay, it's there. It hasn't disappeared, but I relaxed with it. So it's not, and I, in relaxing with it, it became less stressful. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So this practice is, um, it's very forgiving practice. And it encourages us to be forgiving of ourselves. This is not about being perfect at doing something, doing it absolutely right. It's about doing what we can and learning from whatever happens. Any other difficulty that anyone would like to share? Yes, please. I'm, I'm, I'm going to walk toward you because I won't be able to hear you otherwise. Excuse me. <laughs> in the middle of that, uh, a picture came into my mind of me walking very fast. I tend to walk very fast everywhere I go in the clinic, and, and it was like the juxtaposition of how I am most of the time, very dit, 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 and then this. Yes. And saying, it was kind of like, hey, you need to take a look at that. Beautiful. Everybody here? That's what this is about. We're always learning. Thank you very much. You're talking about what, what kind of work do you do? Physician. I thought so. <laughs> Physicians are in a hurry. Almost all the time. And this system makes it much worse, right? I, I, you heard, I do teach at Georgetown Medical School. I don't, I, that's a part-time gig. Mostly I, I run the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. But I do teach, and when we ha work with medical students, we have them do a walking meditation. And walking meditation is a beautiful... Um, how many of you have done walking meditation? Oh, good, a number of you. But it's very simple. These things are simple. You walk slowly, and you pay attention to your thoughts, and feelings, and sensations as they arise. So you say, seeing woman with green sweater, feeling more weight on my left leg, right shoulder in the air, it's nice to be here with you. I'm repeating to you my thoughts, my feelings, and my sensations. That's what walking meditation is. So we have our medical students, first year medical students, who are all stressed out, 100%, um, for one reason or another, or many. We have them walk, 
and they walk through the campus, and they walk slowly, and they pay attention to what they see, and they come back in the room after 15 or 20 minutes of walking, and they say, I didn't know that statue was there. I didn't know that tree was there. Some of them say, I didn't know that building was there. <laughs> Even though they've come through the campus already 500 or 1,000 times. So it's beautiful that you're seeing that. So that would be a thing for you to do. Do walking meditation. Walk a little more slowly. Pay attention to what's going on. Any activity can be a meditation if you bring awareness to it. Walking, cooking, cleaning, dishwashing, meditation for me. Good. Uh, I've learned to love, well, almost to love doing the dishes. It's just a nice time, nice simple task, and I can do it in a you know, kind of pleasant way. Okay, so this is the beginning. I want to be as helpful. This, this workshop is supposed to be practical for all of you, right? To help you to take what we've been doing and what we've been learning and to make it your own. So I'm going to be as practical as I can in doing this. And I'm, I'm happy to you know, look at theoretical questions as well, but I want to make sure that I sort of give you what I can in the course of this day so that you can really use it. So the first thing that's crucial is to bring meditation and the meditative mind into your practice. Everybody's practice. You all work together, right? You're a team. These are folks who do an integrated, what's the name of this integrative cancer care? What's it called? In Spirit Health. In Spirit Health. No, in Spirit Health. In Spirit Say it loud. In Spirit Health. Okay, great. So they do integrative cancer care. Do you all meditate together in the morning? They do, beautiful. I do that with my staff. Every time we have a meeting, we sit for a couple of minutes like this. It helps get rid of all the stuff that we're all bringing in, all the residual irritation or anxiety or apprehension that we may have, so we can be a little clearer and a little kinder with each other. Meditation, and I'll come back to this, and we can, as the model unfolds. We can answer questions about it. Every patient I see is meditating, one form or another. Not 40 minutes a day, most of them, maybe 15 or 5. Doesn't have to be big, fancy, onerous thing. It can be very simple, but it begins to change the way we look at the world. So always meditation is central to my prescription. And meditation can be quiet meditation, it can be slow walking meditation, or it can be a moving meditation. And we'll do one of those a little bit later this morning. The second piece of our work is to ask people who come to our trainings, and you have some information about Center for Mind-Body Medicine trainings we can talk about that more later if you'd like. Um, when they are in a group or to ask people individually, I ask people individually when they come to see me and I almost always do it on the telephone before they come to see me, why are you coming to see me? Why? What you, why, why are you coming and why me? Now if you work in a clinic and people don't know you're there and they're just coming, still it's important, why are you coming? And we were taught this in medical school, we just haven't, don't always pay so much attention to it. Why are you coming here, and why are you coming now? The classic question in the emergency room was, how did you happen to get here? And the classic answer was, by bus. <laughs> or by some, well, that's, no, why, why now? What's going on? And what would you like to get? So I'm going to ask you that question, a few of you, just to give you a sense, because it's very important in shaping what's going to happen. Uh, and it's very important in working with people to make sure you're on the same page. And this also applies in a place like Haiti. Why are you coming here? Even though you may have to deal with 5,000 people who are coming and they're, you know, everybody needing help, why? 
getting everybody focused on what, what are you here for and what would you like to get. So I'm asking that question. A couple, just a, we don't have, if, if we were a small group in our training program and we were going around the table and there were 10, each person would have a chance to reflect on that, to say uh, who you are, uh, why you're here, and how you're feeling right now. Those are the questions. So why are you here? What would you like to get out of this day? Anybody? Yes. So who are you? So tell us who you are. Come stand up. You're going to st stand up. Yeah, this is all, also a course in public speaking. <laughs> Teach first year physician assistant. for your students? Uh -huh. How about for yourself? I already know a fair amount of them. So what would you like to learn? Where's the gap between what you know and what you would like to convey to them? I think when you talk about teaching medical students walking meditation, uh, that turned a light on in my brain. More techniques like that, that you can, you can get them to try. You know, they won't do everything, uh, but uh, more examples Beautiful. Okay, let me make a, I'm going to make a couple points here and then we'll, I want to hear from somebody else. First of all, I asked her, what about for you? And she says, I'm doing these. So this is absolutely central. If you're going to teach somebody else something, so if you're going to teach walking meditation, do it 15, 20 times yourself till it becomes a part of you. This is not, people trained in the medical system PAs, MDs, RNs, see one, do one, teach one. No, it's not like that. It's learn one, do it in this work of self-care. Learn one, do one, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. And then a moment will come when it's so much a part of you that you will know when the appropriate time is to use it with others. Not because it's Dr. Gordon said do this. It's because is it Lucy because Lucy feels sitting with this group of young PAs this is the right time to do it with them. Everybody understand the difference? So this work is all about taking whatever you learn here and using it yourself with yourself on yourself discovering the benefits and also discovering the difficulties. That way you will have compassion. You'll have a sense of hope and possibility. We'll talk more about that. Um, I may not do all the slides. You have all my slides. I really want to connect and, and, and talk with you. You'll have a sense of hope and possibility in situations where other people might not because you've seen that you can change. And we're, speaking for myself, I'm among the most stubborn people on the planet, and change is not always so easy for me. So if I can do it, then it's possible for other people. And also, I have difficulties with it. And if I, with all my privilege and prerogatives, have difficulties, and I'm talking with someone whose life is so much more overwhelmed by material conditions than mine, I need to have compassion for them. So it's both. It's both understanding what's possible and it's also understanding the difficulties. And if you can cultivate those two, 
as we, and have that experience and share it with others, amazing things will happen. Anyone else? Yes, please. Say, stand up, say who you are. And... Uh, my name is Marisa, and I'm kind of confused. I just realized that I'm not necessarily just getting confused. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, um, I'm unemployed, and you know, I had not been in the hospital for 30 years. <coughs> Last August, I was hospitalized with a severe kidney infection for four days. The 30 year before had been an elective surgery based on some recommendations for, from my doctor. However, then what happened was that I got some results on my annual exams, colonoscopy, uh, had a polyp, had to have it removed, etc. Pap smear came back up normal. I've had like two biopsies and three pap smears. I just had a multi-site biopsy. I was hospitalized outpatient for that. And so I'm sitting here thinking, you know, something's going on with me because I have not had, it's like I've been to the doctor and had issues health-wise more so since last August than I have it in my entire almost 61 years. And I know I don't look my age. It's okay for you to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I just, there, so I just, I thought, okay, I'm here for CEUs, but God has a real interesting way of placing me where I need to hear the information that's being shared. So thank you. Okay, great. You're welcome. I, I, She'll take the bike. I'll take the question. Um, the, I, it's great that you're here because this understanding that you're coming to is the understanding that somehow these things that for the last few hundred years medicine has seen as disconnected or separate, that somehow it's all connected. A number of you are nodding your heads. This is a piece of wisdom that unfortunately has not been emphasized as central to all of our health and all of our health care. That as we look, because I'll tell you a story. <laughs> a story about a friend of mine. Um, <clears throat> I, I began to learn acupuncture 40 years ago. And uh, <laughs> in the so in the early 70s, I was just starting to learn. And a, a friend of mine was a very hard-nosed guy. Uh, very, so New York, Jewish, as am I, but New York Jewish tougher than I am. And he was political, and he'd been an organizer, and he'd been actually a Stalinist, if you can imagine somebody being, and how hard-headed you have to be to be a Stalinist. Uh, anyway, uh, aside from politics, he loved to play basketball. And uh, we'll call him Paul. Well, Paul, I, uh, call him Paul. Paul's a good name for him. It's not his name, but <laughs> it's close enough. Um, and he came to me and he said, Jim, you know, uh, uh, you know I, I, I hurt my ankle playing ball, and I really want to play ball, and the, the, the orthopedist can't do anything for me, and it's not getting any better. And I know you're getting into this acupuncture stuff. Um, what do you think about using acupuncture? I said, that's a great idea. And I'm going to send you to Dr. Chang at Holy Cross Hospital, who's an anesthesiologist, Chinese, who's doing acupuncture. Because I'm not really, I'm just beginning to learn. So he went, he said, oh, he said I don't, you know, I don't believe any of this crap. <laughs> but... Uh, but I really love to play ball. <laughs> so, so yeah, I said, you don't have to believe it. Uh, I understand, I got interested partly in acupuncture because I read some of the animal studies. I read a study on treating laminitis, inflammation of the hooves in oxen. And I thought, this is not a placebo effect with an ox. You've ever met an ox? <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so Paul, a couple weeks later, I saw him again. He said, I gotta tell you, I, I went to see Dr. Chang and um, he started putting needles in my ankle and then he put needles here in my, uh, I thought, oh, that's right, you know, my ankle's what hurts, he's putting needles there. Then he starts putting needles here in my chest and I, I'm wondering what he's doing, what, what's going on? And then he starts putting needles in my head. And so I say to him, I said, Dr. Chang, what the hell are you doing? He said, 
how is this up here connected to that down there? He said, and Dr. Chang looks at me and he says, whole body connected, look and see. <laughs> So it's all connected. And we know this, every traditional system of healing understands this, not just Chinese medicine. Ayurveda, Kurandarismo, all the traditional systems understand this. We are now learning this at a physiological and biochemical and molecular level. So that many conditions, for example, including some of the ones that you're describing, inflammation is a common denominator. Inflammation is important in heart disease and cancer and uh, gallbladder disease and bowel disease. So you don't run after each organ and send somebody to six different specialists, really. Sometimes I wonder what do do ordinary doctors do since they're specialists for every organ? I mean, what, what's, what's left? Um, you address the fundamental problem, which perhaps is inflammation, which may be increased significantly by stress. Stress is a major factor at a molecular and epigenetic level, that is in terms of affecting gene expression in producing inflammation. Genetic, you know, it, it, genes are the structured the way they are, but the environment, including our levels of stress, affects how the genes operate in the body. So this is a crucial point, and this is a point I want to bring home for all of you, that everything in our body is connected, that there are certain basic processes, and we're not going to focus on inflammation or oxidative stress today. That's material for another course. Those of you who are interested, our food as medicine course in June goes into the, how food can affect all these. Has anybody been here been to food as medicine? Yeah, just one. Hi. There's one person. Um, it's a great course. It's four days. It's the course that you always wish you'd had in school uh, and that you wish you still could have. Four days. And look at, take a look at it. If it interests you, come. Uh, but it addresses these issues of, of basic biological issues, which are so crucial. I'll come to you in a sec. I want, today I'm going to talk about stress, which is as crucial or more crucial to these processes than any other, any other happening. Yes? The, the, yeah, the course, you, ha you have it in your, in your, you should have a flyer. Yeah, here's a flyer for it. It's called Food as Medicine. Four days in Washington, the Center for Mind-Body Medicine presents it. It's the best short course in nutrition you'll find anywhere. And also we have great food. And it's very, very practical. Because again, you can learn everything in the world about nutrition, but if you don't eat good food, you know, if you're just handing out pills and supplements, it's not gonna make that much difference. And also, the other thing I wanna say that's connected is if you don't deal with stress, you can eat the best food on the planet and still be sick as a, I don't want to malign dogs, you can still be very sick. Because you can't digest it. So you understand what I'm saying? You remember what happens when you're under stress is the gut works highly inefficiently. Every part of the gut works inefficiently. So you don't, you don't, you don't bring into your body the nutrients that are there in the food. So stress, this work of dealing with stress, of mind-body medicine, of self-care, is absolutely central to any work that we're going to do. And it's central to taking care of yourself. Okay, so those are two, two people who've expressed ideas, intentions about what they would like to get out of this time that we have together. Let me go through a little bit of the background and a little bit of the perspective on what this field is about. Show you some slides, and then we can have some questions about that. And then after that, we'll move into some of the applications, some of the more specific applications. But keep in mind what you want to get out of today. And as things unfold, 
If we're not covering what's important to you, raise your hand. Uh, and if we are, take note of it. So no relevant financial relationships, OK? Put away your phones. This is a good idea. This is an interesting challenge. Do you have people put away their phones when they come into your office? It's a good idea. Uh, working in Israel, everybody's on the phone 24-7. So check your phones. No phones. OK. This is the shift. I, I don't know how well you can see it. The, the basic shift that has to happen, and I'm going to talk in some about this tonight as well, but in a slightly different way. The basic shift that has to happen is from a biomedical model in which drugs and surgery are preeminent and in which the habit of mind that says the people who perform surgery and prescribe drugs have the answers, all the answers to our problems, that that model has to shift. That's the model we've been operating under uh, very clearly for the last several hundred years in the West. And it's a model that developed for very particular reasons. Because we saw some of the great advances. First of all, the advances in uh, ways of uh, forms of observation through the microscope, for example. We, then later on, we saw advances in therapeutic technologies, surgery, anesthesia, development of later development of antibiotics, uh, insulin for insulin-dependent diabetes. We came up with a model in which there are answers to the diseases that we have. Those answers come from drugs and surgery and from the scientists and the physicians and other healthcare professionals who prescribe or administer those procedures. Everybody with me? That's the, that's the model we're still operating under, correct? That's the dominant medical model. The, the problem is it doesn't work very well. And although it may work if you have an overwhelming infection or if you are hit by a truck or you need to have your gallbladder taken out, it does not work very well for most of the chronic illnesses that most of us and the vast majority of our patients have the vast majority of the time. Simply doesn't work. And we have come to understand that. So there needs to be, if anybody has any questions about that, please raise your hand. But it just, it's, it's just become increasingly painfully obvious. And it's also uh, not incidentally bankrupting us. That model says drugs and surgery are central, complementary and alternative medical therapies, or acupuncture, herbalism, whatever, or psychosocial approaches are peripheral. Or in the language that you sometimes hear in medical circles, that's nice, dear, but. Um, the new model is based on self-care as central. If you think about some of the most dramatic advances, one of the most dramatic advances in medicine, in biomedicine, in recent years has been the development of bypass surgery for coronary heart disease. Well, it turns out that most of the time, if you don't change the way you're living and eating and dealing with stress and exercising, you need another bypass five years later. So it's not the answer. The only real response that's adequate to conditions like heart disease comes from self-care. I commend to you, how many of you know Dean Ornish's work with heart disease? OK, it's really worth taking a look. And I, I cite some of the papers in here. Just read a paper of his. You don't have to read books or anything else. But basically, everything that he is doing to reverse heart disease is self-care except for the fact that the group, the support group, is led by a professional. Our work with post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, and chronic illness is exactly the same. We're teaching self-care. That's what I'm talking about today. I'm not talking about acupuncture. You need to go to school to do acupuncture. 
I'm talking about self-care that anyone from the age of 3 to 93 can do. And we work with kids as young as 3, and I'm happy to talk about working with kids and the people who are quite old. Self-care has got to be central. Otherwise, we're not going to change this pattern in our lives or in the lives of our country and our community. The next circle are therapies that require <clears throat> a professional, but that enhance our capacity to help and heal ourselves. So being a group leader, as we train people to be group leaders, whether they're doctors, nurses, psychologists, or leaders of women's groups, or high school teachers, somebody's got to be trained to lead that group, but their work is to help people to heal themselves. Understand that? Everybody with me on this? Acupuncture works primarily to help the body to heal itself. It's not an intervention with, with potentially downside of negative side effects like pharmacotherapy. Manipulation, the way osteopaths and chiropractors and physical therapists and others may do it, is also putting the body in place so it can heal itself. So that's the second circle. The third circle <coughs> is drugs and surgery. Absolutely crucial at certain times, but hugely overused. Hugely. <coughs> Paul, this Paul, mentioned, uh, who loves basketball too, <laughs> mentioned Unstuck. Um, Unstuck is my most recent book, and it's about working with depression and seeing depression as a journey uh, toward health and wholeness, the beginning of a journey toward health and wholeness, rather than the end point of a pathological process. It's like as a wake-up call. It's like something's out of balance. At the beginning of that of Unstuck, I, I devote some pages, if you're interested in looking at this, to a critique of the use of antidepressants. And I, su I suggest you look, at, I mean, I hope you'll read the book, but the critique is important, not just about antidepressants, but as you think about all medication. Because it turns out that the conventional wisdom about antidepressants is that they are 60 to 70% better than placebo, than sugar pills. That's the conventional wisdom. That's based on the published studies. When you look at the unpublished studies, which had to be filed with the Food and Drug Administration but were never published by the drug companies, you see a very different result. And you see that antidepressants are little, if any, better than sugar pills. And there are some reanalyses of this data that show they're actually worse than sugar pills. I'm sorry? Especially long term. Are, are you a psychiatrist, psychologist? Chemist. Chemist. All right, excellent. <laughs> yes, and that's the whole other side. On top of that, they have all these negative side effects. Because, unfortunately, the drug company chemists are afflicted with this, Id with this idea that everything is separate from everything else. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that if you affect serotonin metabolism, you also <laughs> affect not only serotonin metabolism in a few parts of the brain, serotonin metabolism everywhere in the body. Or they don't pay, and you affect all the other neurotransmitters. So, yeah. So, the data has now been looked at and reanalyzed in papers in the Journal of the American Medical Association and in the New England Journal and in PLOS Medicine. It's an online journal. Three authoritative papers, slightly different ways of looking at the data, but all of them with essentially the same conclusion. So that's out there, and yet Antidepressant drugs are still a $12 billion a year business. And we have 30 million people in this country who are still taking them. So we want to talk about science. Let's talk about science as opposed to dogma. The dogma is this old model. Somebody comes in, they're really depressed, drugs are the answer. In fact, there was a study published in a family medicine journal Rand Corporation study that showed that it only took 
three minutes for primary care physicians to write a prescription for antidepressants from the time the patient began talking about what was going on. This is not medicine. This is, this is an assembly line. Not paying attention and also not paying attention to the evidence. So that way doesn't work. And don't take my word for it, please. Look, read the studies, make up your own mind. This is not about believing me. This is about, you know, there are ideas and possibilities you can follow up with your own experience and with your own reading. But that doesn't mean drugs and surgery are never necessary. They are, of course they are. But Hippocrates said it very well. He said, in extreme situations, extreme remedies. So when nothing else works, then of course you use what you have to, even though, as the chemist says, there will likely be long-term side effects down the road. OK, any questions about this at this point? Yes, please. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, you got to shout. Coming in with their aches and pains, stomach aches, headaches, whatever. And this whole question, why are you here? What are you looking for? And what I say to myself, so many of these folks coming in do not know that they're coming in for soul medicine. It's not pills, it's not the, the surgery but it's addressing issues of the soul. It's a, a way deeper thing. That, but they come in, the, the, the clinical descriptors would be anxiety and depression. I also take care of young soldiers. But it's how to integrate you know, the things you're talking about in a different approach into a primary uh, care setting. Uh, and uh, so, you know, they're, they're, I try to incorporate things like this, but uh, to, to find a model that works. And this, you, you talk about uh, teaching self-care to the three-year-old. It's almost like this needs to be a whole kind of national cultural shift. And where you learn this is how it's been modeled to you in your home and Great. by the caring adults around you in all facets of the interface. Your teachers, uh, you know, within the faith-based settings uh, and uh, the, the, the clinical setting, uh, it's almost as if at that point they would not be coming in to see you. Mm -hmm. Great, you said it beautifully. That is what's required. But explain what you mean when you say soul issues, so people will understand. Well, it's it's uh, people's <coughs> sense of, uh, uh, to me, uh, not understanding or uh, or, or <coughs> purpose in life, um, uh, connections and trust with others. There's so many issues that have to do with uh, attachment and trust and uh, connections with meaningful people around them. Great. Uh, abandonment or sense uh, of, of hope or not, uh, but they're coming into you uh, fatigued, sleepless, aching. Yep. And it, it's not muscle ache, it's soul ache. Beautiful. Everybody hear what, you, what she's saying? This is a very beautiful statement of what's going on. And it really is what has to be addressed. Has to be addressed in clinical settings, as you say, in schools, at home, one of the ways that we address it is by creating these groups. Uh, this is a crucial part, I think, I mean, obviously, since I'm devoting myself to it, this is a crucial part of this process of healing and of translating the physical symptoms into soul work without saying to somebody, you have to do soul work. Uh, do you, everybody understand what I'm saying? You have to meet people where they are. Their pain is in their shoulder or their neck. And you listen to that. 
And if you can create, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go on, but the idea is you create a setting in which it's possible for people to make this discovery themselves, where nobody's saying this is what that means, where you're finding out for yourself. Yes, do you want to say? doctors doing is I just say, we've been doing that for 50 years. We have the pie, pe a person in environment. So our approach to doing that is where the person is at. So we don't make that divide between the mental and the physical because it's all the same thing. Your mind resides within your brain, which is a physical entity. It's a, it, you know, gives rise to that. So there's none of this dichotomy. Great. And the findings certainly of them is that talk therapy work, uh, the, work very good. In fact, uh, the results have been as, as uh, dramatic enough to be able to show that they work better than pharmaceutical. Mm -hmm. for, for, de for depression, you're talking right, about. Yeah. Right. It's, ab it's absolutely right. That tradition is there. Problem is, it's not always honored. It's not honored by insurance companies. It's often not even honored by social workers. Well, it's also a cooperation. It's only in recent times that people working with, because I worked in the VA hospital, so I know working within a team, that you were given a peer level interaction. And when everybody's respectful of all other folks working on a team as their professional peers, you have more of that dichotomy of saying, how are we going to deal with this person on all the levels? Pharmacy, doctor, therapist, uh, counselor, whatever. Those models are the ones that have been the most successful. Thank you. No, I, I, I would agree completely. It, it, and in fact, part of what we're talking about is getting back to the roots of what's there in all of our professions. One of the things that we see is difficulty and dissatisfaction in the healthcare professions. Certainly with, with physicians, um, but also with other, with other health professionals. Uh, nursing is a very good example of, uh, if you get good in nursing, um, this, is, uh, this is apropos, if you get good in nursing, you get promoted to where you don't see patients much, right? <laughs> this is interesting. So the people who are, re and then the patients are given to people who come in and out of the hospital very fast and may not stay very long, and this is in Washington, D.C., and may not have much roots in the community. So it's um, sometimes social, often social workers, unlike you, go off purely do private practice. They see a few people in their offices, just the way a psychologist or psychiatrist maybe. They lose that connection with the environment that you're talking about, that, connect, that sort of holistic point of view. So w part of this is getting back to our roots and what's really vital to these professions that got us interested in them or interested in this work in, in the first place. Um, one of the things that I'm just pointing out here is that this notion of working with psychology, of working with stress, of working with human beings and their own capacity, this has got to be central. I, I call it mental health here, call it self-care. Uh, this has to be central in making this shift. So no matter how much you learn, I'm just gonna talk one more piece and then we'll take a bit of a break. No matter how much you learn about specific techniques, if you come to food as medicine, you learn everything we have to teach, it's still about working with the particular individual and helping that individual discover um, what food means. When we do food as medicine, I do some, we'll do some exercise, other exercises later. I do some things with drawings and mental imagery with food as medicine. Because if you're not working with the psychology, each person's psychology of eating, each person's attitude toward eating, nothing's gonna happen. So for example, if you ask people to draw their relationship to food, you get, if there are 200 people here, you get 200, weirdly, interestingly, wonderfully different drawings. Because it means so many different things to different people. And you can't just have a one diet, one prescription, one way fits every person. You've got to work, and we'll come back to that in a moment, 
You've got to work with that individuality. That's absolutely crucial. Each person is different. And that difference, and each person's going to have a different path to healing and becoming whole. Actually, I think I'll stop now. We'll, have, we'll come back in precisely 15 minutes, okay? So give yourself a chance to move around and... Uh, as a co-chair or tri-chair for National Institutes of Health with uh, Pam Medicine.